awesome. Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us for this little panel Q and A. Um, for our fourth graders at the Madeline Choir School, we have Evan here with us, who's a fourth grader. Evan, wave. Hey. And he's going to ask you all these questions, but let's start with you introducing yourselves. Okay. Um, and I know the panels, the little windows are different on everybody's screen. So how about let's start with Christopher. Hi guys, I'm Christopher Macbeth and I'm the artistic director of Utah Opera and going on my 21st season this October. Wow, that's awesome. Who's going next? Hi, my name is Daniel Belcher and I'm a baritone and I first performed with Utah Opera in 2006 in the Barber Seville and I've had the opportunity to come back many times. So Salt Lake uh, and Utah Opera are absolutely one of my favorite companies and places to go. Ooh, love it. I'm Tara Faircloth and I am a stage director. I started at Utah Opera as an assistant stage director and then they moved me into the big seat and I've done quite a few shows in Utah. I consider Salt Lake City one of my second homes. That's awesome. Um, I'm Paula Fowler. I'm Education and Outreach Director for Utah Opera, and I'm in my 23rd season. A few years more than Christopher. <laughs> Great. I think, Evan, you might remember Tara, don't you? I do. I do. What do you remember her from? Um, Carmen, and it was the best time with her. <laughs> oh, you guys are pretty great. <laughs> so Evan has some questions about opera for all of you. So all the fourth graders handed in the questions, and he's going to ask you all those questions, and we'd love to hear your answers. So Evan, get started. <laughs> well, what is opera? Well, I want to leap in on that one. Um, the easy... <laughs> The easy, simplest answer is that it's a story told through music. So that's, and, and usually the uh, characters sing everything they want to say. But there are some exceptions to that and a lot of varieties in that. But if you just remember a story told through music. And then one other thing that really identifies an opera is the kind of singing that is done. So um, people who sing opera, like Danny, train their whole bodies um, to be able to use their breath and their um, muscles and their, their vocal cords to project their sound without using microphones. So that makes a different kind of um, musical sound than someone who is using a microphone. So what are all the things and people you need to put in together in an opera? Well, I'll ask Tara to help me with this one, but um, before I get a cast together and before we get to even start stagings, we have a lot of people in our facility who are crafts people, they are, make costumes, they make sets, uh, we have rehearsals with the chorus, uh, we have work with our young artists here, and that's all has to happen in the months and sometimes years before we even start a rehearsal. And then when we start rehearsals, I turn it all over to the director, who's going to tell you what we, where we go from there. Oh, boy. So in the, in the sometimes months and years before we start rehearsals, I also meet with designers, uh, costume designers, set designers, lighting designers, property designers. And uh, we come up with an idea. And then when we come to the rehearsal room, I spend a lot of time working with the singers um, to help them understand uh, where, uh, how they're feeling, what they're thinking, just like a movie director does. We, I talk to the singers about the music and what it means and what we're trying to say. And um, so there's work with the singers, then there work with stage managers who are a whole group of people who are really bossy in all the best ways. Um, and they keep us running on time and make sure we're in the right place and holding all the right things. And uh, then there are, as Christopher mentioned, the chorus. Uh, which is sometimes quite a lot of people. In Carmen, I think there were like 50 people in the chorus, plus maybe 20 kids. I, I really don't remember. I've blocked that out. Um, and, <laughs> yeah. and that's just in the rehearsal room. And so then when we go to the stage, we have tons of people backstage helping us, moving the sets around, making sure everyone, again, has the right costumes on and that the right set scenery is in the right place. So it's quite an operation. Wow. We shouldn't crazy. forget we have a music director in the form of a conductor <laughs> who makes sure that we all stay together regardless of what the director tells them to do. 
Now, okay. what's the music part all about? What's that? <laughs> <laughs> all right, Evan, I'm going to throw one of those questions um, out there. Where did opera originate? Oh, I, I would like to talk about that. The um, history of the opera, of the art form that we call opera, started in Italy in the city of Florence around 400 years ago. And um, it was a cool new thing. This uh, group of artists called the Camarata worked together to, to use all the art forms to help tell a story through music for the first time. And those early operas were all about God, they were serious and they were about gods and royalty and uh, took a couple hundred years, but the comedy started making its way in. But those earliest operas were all in Italy, even when they were written in Austria or Germany or France. Um, the first operas went that way. Even Mozart wrote some of his operas in Italian. And eventually then all the countries started writing in their own languages. And we have operas written in English today. What kind of stories are usually used in operas? I can do that. Every story. Um, a lot of comedies, a lot of tragedies. Uh, people do die, uh, but also a lot of people end up happily ever after. Uh, and now the cool thing is there's so much new opera being written. Many times we think of opera as kind of an older art form, but there's all these amazing pieces being written about stories that are happening right now or the last few years and stories that take place in America or stories that uh, we, we've incorporated war stories, but it's stories of now. So opera was kind of always an art form reflecting a uh, society at its point in time. And uh, yeah. Could well, I just, <laughs> could I add that um, our resident artists, when they visit in high schools, they play a genre game uh, with the students. They say, think of all those categories on Netflix and uh, see if you come up with a category and stump us. But we, they, they bet the students that they can name something for everything they think about. Cooking shows, they've got an example, um, horror operas, ghost stories, as well as romance and historical things. We just did an opera this year, um, Silent Night, that's based on a movie script that's based on history. So they come from all kinds of places. Yeah, what's the opera that's based on a cooking show? Um, it's the genre. It's bon appétit. Bon appétit. <laughs> it's it's a it's a one. Oh, I, one I know. Person show and she Blue makes child. a cake while yeah. she's singing the entire time. Our uh, coach Carol Anderson has performed it. Oh, that's excellent. <laughs> Wonderful. All right, Evan. Next one. How do they make all of the costumes? Well, we have, um, a, as Tara talked about, she starts meeting with a costume designer. Uh, and if she had her way, that'd be about five years before the show. Uh, <laughs> I generally give her, I give her the 18 to 24 month time period, usually, uh, if that. And, um, and then uh, it takes usually a good three to four months of dedicated time by our costume shop if it's a full chorus show. Uh, and a large number of principals to make from scratch all of their costumes. Evan, I don't know if you got to see it when you were doing Carmen there, but there is the most enormous building uh, at Utah Opera with, it's like a, a football field of costumes. It's amazing. It's like the biggest department store in the world and it's just costumes and costumes and costumes. And that's right there in Salt Lake. How many people can be in an opera? Well, the smallest one that we know of is that cooking <laughs> opera with one singer and one pianist. I think, is, is it always a pianist, Christopher, for Bon Appetit? Yes. And then Christopher, you tell about the biggest one. Uh, when you get into things like um, grand opera, as we call it, uh, Turandot is probably a great example of that. Uh, you're working anywhere from 50 to 75 in the orchestra. You're working with generally about 40 people in the chorus. You've got another eight principals on top of that. And then it takes usually a good 20 people backstage to make it all happen. So children's course. don't forget the children's course. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Yeah. And the children's yeah. course. Thank you, Melody. Is it just a solo or do people actually sing together? Both. Um, in, in opera, when a person is singing by themselves, it's called an aria. 
And so that's kind of like uh, if, if you were just singing a song or you were telling your own story, I would sing my aria. But then we also have duets and we have trios and quartets and then huge ensembles where all the principal singers and the chorus are singing together. So we have the, the, all of the above. Do you have to sing in a certain range to be in an opera? Yes, uh, that just depends on the opera. So I'm a baritone. So that means I, I, um, I kind of live between the tenors and I live between the basses uh, in the male category. And then for women, you have soprano, mezzo, alto, contralto. And so the repertoire I sing are, uh, are all roles that kind of fit my instrument are all these baritone roles. Some are, like we said earlier, some are comedic, some are tragic. It's kind of fun to think that composers use the voice types like a color palette, you know, that helps characterize, you know, Danny's, Danny's range uh, fits particular kinds of characters. Mm -hmm. A lot, what, what do you usually, what kinds of characters I, do you play? I do a lot of comedy and then I do a lot of new music because my, my voice can kind of, I'll try and do anything with it. Uh, composers like to, uh, I'm lucky, like to write for me. But uh, I, comedy has always been really prevalent in my career. And is it true that it's always the soprano or the tenor who's the hero of the opera? Usually. <laughs> but but uh, in new music now, I'm pretty lucky, including one opera that we did, that I got to do with actually three singers from your school. Yeah. Uh, it was called The Long Walk. And uh, my character was kind of the, the lead throughout, and it's about his journey. So not always is it the soprano and the tenor. Yeah. yeah. And I want you to add that Danny does a lot of comedy because he's actually a very silly fellow in real life anyway. I'm kind of a goof, yeah. <laughs> my daughter asked me when when I was young she was like dad what do you do I have a 15 year old daughter and I said you know what I play make-believe <laughs> I do I'm I, I'm now 49 years old and I still and I just live in the land of imagination so I have a pretty cool job do opera singers have to try out to be in an opera yes a <laughs> lot <laughs> a lot a lot of auditions I've done in the last uh, 30 years what does that look like? Yeah. What does that look like? So a singer goes in and say, for example, I would go do an audition for Christopher. Uh, I'm not sure what his future seasons look like, but I go and present arias. Remember those solos that I talked about? And it's usually in different languages, uh, English, Italian, German, French, maybe something in Russian. And I will start with an aria the person running the company will maybe ask for a second piece and it's with piano and so just the pianist plays and that's the end of your audition usually uh if the if the artistic director is looking for something specific they may want to hear more or you may have a little dialogue but usually an audition lasts somewhere mm, eight to ten minutes how do you choose your singers for an opera uh, there, with operas that are standard, so operas that have been around for a while, there are some, uh, with particular roles, there are things that you're sort of looking for. It's already been established. You need this kind of actor, this kind of singer, this kind of quality, uh, whether it's a color, whether it's a size, whether it's a personality. Um, uh, so you tend to find the people who are either have a history of singing with those roles or are moving in that direction uh, with those roles. Uh, what's really fun is when you do opera that's relatively recent, you're sort of, the handcuffs come off mm -hmm. and you get to choose people that you really know would bring something special to their roles. Mm -hmm. Uh, and often it's, you know, there is discussion with the director about this, about uh, people that we know in common. Uh, sometimes, uh, often there's uh, discussion with the conductor as well, people that they've worked with and, and think might be great and, and they make suggestions. So it's, it's a whole bunch of, it's kind of like going back to the one woman opera. It's, it's making a cake uh, and you get to play with all these different ingredients. What is the difference between a conductor and a director? Ah, well, I'm very embarrassed that I left out my musical colleagues earlier when I was talking about what makes an opera, uh, because one of my most important um, partners in the, the job is uh, my conductor friend. And so 
I think the easiest way to think about it is the conductor is in charge of the musical element, uh, which is obviously a big part of what makes an opera. Um, and then I'm in charge of the dramatic elements, and that includes things that you look at. Um, so, but yeah, so that's it. Conductor does the music. I do the drama and visuals. Do you get paid in an opera? Usually. Hopefully. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Right now. yes. Yeah, that's, uh, this is my job. So yes. that's, I, and I'm lucky enough to say that for 27 years, it's been my job. Do you need to understand the languages that you sing in? You need to understand what you're singing. Now that might sound a little different. Um, I, I always know what I'm singing in French, German, Italian, the words that are coming out of my mouth. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm completely fluent in the languages. I will say I can get by if I go to, a, to Italy, I can order off the menu, I can ask for directions, I can have small conversations, but I can't talk about a ton of things. But every word that I'm singing in an opera, my job is the storyteller. So if I don't know what I'm singing, what the words mean, it's hard for me to tell the story. So yes, in an opera, I always know every word coming out of my mouth, what that means in English. If you don't speak Italian, how do you know what the singers are seeing about the opera and if it is in Italian? We always like to um, perform operas in the, usually the language of the composer, the, the language it was originally written in. Um, but in a performance, we'll have a screen up above the stage um, for super titles. And I know, I think I remember, Tara, that you get really involved because that's a, a way of managing the storytelling as well and um, yeah. making sure that, that the translation really matches what's going on on the stage. Yeah, and I guess yeah. also it comes at the right time, right? Right. Yeah. Is being in an opera time consuming? Yes. <laughs> um, as kind of everyone has said, uh, I, when I'm learning a role, um, I usually know kind of what I'm doing maybe a year to two years in advance. And so I have to, sh I have to start working to, to learn the role, to learn the language, to learn all those notes on the page, what you guys always have to do for all of your performances. Um, and then so that when I come to rehearsal, I don't get to hold my script or the score. That kind of sits down and we start staging immediately and I have to have it all up here. So it takes a lot of preparation for me before I get in the rehearsal room. And then once I'm in the rehearsal room, I say that's now the time that we can experiment because a lot of my decisions come from what the director is suggesting or what the conductor and also my fellow singers. I get different ideas from the people I'm playing with. So that's why I said, you know, it's all, I'm playing make-believe, but it's all of us kind of together in there creating the story and the story that we want to tell. How does it feel to be the director to so many people? Well, I love it. <laughs> um, you know what, I have to tell you, and I'm not just buttering you guys up, but some of my very favorite operas in the world are the ones with the children's chorus in them. <laughs> um, and those are usually big ones. And um, luckily, I just love working with the chorus. I love working with children's chorus. And um, yeah, so it's a lot of fun. It's a real gas. And then I'm pretty exhausted after it's over. Let's throw this out, Peggy. What's a great opera for children? My current favorite is The Little Prince. And I wish we had recordings of it um, ever since the experience last year. And I, we whisper to Christopher, every three years or something. <laughs> it would be wonderful yeah. to have that. Um, over the years, I, from the repertoire, Hansel and Gretel, the opera, and Magic Flute are my favorites for children of all ages. Mm -hmm. And I want the Little Prince to join that trio. <laughs> yeah. Danny, as a parent, what did you introduce Maddie to as she was growing up? Her, I'm sure she saw everything you did. Yeah, and the, the first thing she actually ever saw me do was the Magic Flute. And I was in San Francisco, and I introduced it to her. Uh, she was four and um she she was a little too literal with it uh and thought that at the end of the first act when they put the black bag on my head that i was in trouble and she took off running down the aisle what are you doing to my dad oh, and, um, my so so yeah opera and theater have long been a it's been a part of her life because my my wife is actually a director too so madeline has been raised in a green room of theater 
you around the world at all times. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. Um, I really appreciate it. Thank you, Evan, also for asking all those great questions. Great job, Evan. <laughs>